I spent a good time in my career working undercover, chasing different gangs and what have you. I've done 21 years in prison my entire life, and I'm 45. So I've done half of my life in prison. Holy moly. As I really started to evaluate whether or not I wanted to continue law enforcement, and cells had always tugged at me. I see some horrific things. I've seen chainsaws go to work. I've seen machetes go to work. I've seen body parts that weren't supposed to be apart from each other. I've seen some very empty souls that were shells of men who had no remorse for life at all. It took a guy that's in the same shoes you were to get out, to win in business, to really reinvest back into somebody, to make sure they don't go back to that life. And now I'll pass it along as much Amen as I can. Amen to that, bro, man. Right around 2019 is when the whole faith and financial side really started mm -hmm. to collide. I got saved and baptized in 2019, and then I opened my first business in 2019. David Harris Jr., he says, God sent his only son to be slaughtered and his blood to purify and clean everybody's sins in this world. But yours? That hit hard. Imagine a living room with about a dozen guys tatted up, Gucci, Louis, Rolexes, I style. Come and see former cartel get baptized by a narco and a Super Bowl champion. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are the odds of that? Yeah, right? Right. People have the the misconception that God is weak or you gotta turn your cheek. What people don't understand is God is a God of war. He loves his warriors. He loves his yeah, soldiers. Sure. He demands the level of respect. Mm -hmm. I'm warning mm -hmm. you, you don't want what's coming <laughs> with that. <laughs> and uh, he'll destroy countries. And, and yeah. there's one statement on there that says, I will erase you and your whole bloodline from the face of this earth. You have never existed here. That was the most powerful gangster shit I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. I said, that's the kind of God I could get behind. Former United States Marine SWAT cop versus cartel leader. What will happen on this episode? Stand by and you'll find out. What's cracking, everybody? My name is Smart Guy, Matt Zapala here. Halen T from Dallas, Texas. And in the studio today with me is Travis Ala, Ayla and uh, Jose Escamilla Jr. And uh, we're going to have an interesting conversation today. But what unites us is one thing and is our faith our Father in Heaven, and uh, praise God that He's healed a lot of us and brought us all back together as entrepreneurs making a difference in our community. So uh, before I uh, bring them on, I want to introduce Travis Ayla. Uh, Travis here isn't just any coach. He's a former United States Marine SWAT leader and undercover detective turned powerhouse entrepreneur and speaker. You'll learn more about his story here in a second. Jose Escamilla Jr. was born into a legacy of extreme adversity, challenges, and struggles. Many have faced throughout their lives during various times in human history, and he continues to not let the situational circumstances of his life be the defining legacy he pursues. I interviewed a gentleman named Ryan Stuman earlier, uh, actually a couple years ago, when I first moved here to Dallas. He was telling me a story about how he uh, uh, got in prison, and uh, gang leaders were running into prison, and uh, one of the people running the gang, the Latino gang, is this guy. So we're going to hear about his story here. But uh, with that being said, gentlemen, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad Conversation Podcast. What's up, man? Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Crack like and thanks for coming here, man. Very good. Travis? Yes, sir. Devil Dog. Let, let's, let's start with you. Uh, uh, I was sharing with everybody uh, before he got here that, uh, 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 Jordan, if you can uh, show my screen here real quick. Uh, I go to Elevate Life Church. And one and one morning, and one morning, Pastor Keith Kraft was sharing a story about this United States Marine, and my son was in the audience with me that day. And uh, anyway, make a long story short, Pastor Keith Kraft, after sharing a video and the story of Travis, he asked a question: Who would like to give their life to Christ today? And um, you know, just like any altar call, I'm like, okay, cool people around me, and awesome, that's awesome. And um, he asked the second question. All right, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, for the people, ask the person to your left and your right, did you raise your hand? Did you raise your hand? Did you want to raise your hand? And I went to, jokingly to my son, did you raise your hand? He goes, I did. And I'm like, you did? He goes, are you sure you did? Yeah, I raised my hand, Dad. You raise your hand, accept Christ. He goes like, I did. <laughs> Holy moly, right? And it was after Travis's testimony on stage, a friend of mine, Mark Kassar, took pictures of this moment, awesome, awesome, awesome moment. And there, there's us here. Um, uh, is, is, is there a little lag on the on the screen there? Uh, perfect, perfect. 
So there it is. We're, we're coming back from the altar call, and uh, it's my son, Jojo. And I, I still got this look on my face like, I can't believe what, is, what just I happened. <laughs> right? was look at the face. Like, it looked like a proud moment. <laughs> like a yeah. proud moment. Right? Like going back to our chairs. Still but, processing it. But uh, Travis, talk to us about your story, brother. Talk to us about you know, what really impacted me about your story is not only were you a United States Marine, but you went through some tragedy serving as a cop, serving as a SWAT officer, and in, in, in the, the unforeseen tragedy of the accident happened. Mm-hmm. But uh, before we get into that, talk to us about your story. Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so, uh, grew up, we'll just say, without strong father figure, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's not necessarily a unique story. Uh, but in doing so, it definitely pushed me through a lifestyle of pursuing um, some form of leadership, some form of uh, validation, and just really trying to prove myself out there. Uh, that led to the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of a lot of guys that led to which, military. Which uh, so I was a start off as an O two thirty one, so intelligence, intelligence specialist, intelligence, yep. yeah. and then uh, field radio operator after that. Gotcha. Is, is there such thing as Marine Corps intelligence, man? I mean, if we're comparing <laughs> Marines, right? <laughs> <laughs> if we're comparing other branches, I don't really. That's it, brother. That's it, brother. Um, and then, and so, uh, uh, how many how many years did you end up doing? Uh, so right at four, got out in O six. Um, had no idea what I was going to do. Yeah, right. A lot, a lot of service guys do, uh, and women, right? Get out and kind of lose their sense of identity that the branch has given them. Uh, got back into restaurants and things that I'd done prior, and ultimately found myself back into a brotherhood environment in law enforcement. Um, Typically, what most service members do. Yep. Cop, firefighter, postal worker, mm-hmm. something with something with the trades. You chose law enforcement. Yeah, structure, yeah. all that stuff, right? Right. So structure, chose, chose law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course, I, I was young and driven and alpha, ego, all these things. Yeah. So uh, as soon as I got in, I was like, how do I become SWAT? How do I become uh, undercover? All the cool stuff you see on TV. Sure. So pursued making a name for myself there and did so. Uh, I'd say within about two years, got on SWAT, uh, got on uh, narcotics, undercover, uh, became a team leader on SWAT team, um, lead detective on a Nice. Uh, narco unit did a lot of work out of DC, Baltimore, and uh, really was filling myself. If I'm, if I'm being honest, for sure. Uh, <laughs> let, <laughs> What's let, the coolest thing about being a SWAT through. officer um, versus just a regular beat cop? Obviously, I, I, you know the high level stuff that you're trained in. Yeah, I mean it's it's shorter adrenaline rushes, but very intense. Right. Um, the thing about working the road is you never know what environment you're going into. It's mm-hmm. all just open world environment. You don't know what the risks are. You don't know what the challenges are going to be. Um, but when you get ready to knock down a door, like yeah, it's a rush. You, you know the yeah. the odds of a gun being on the other side, the odds of somebody not wanting to go to jail, come out alive, all these things just gets very heightened, mm-hmm. right? So the difference being on the road, it's a constant up and down. Um, when you're in SWAT, yeah. like it's always up. Right. That's right. So even if it's a barricade, it's a suicidal subject, whatever it may be, you know you're you're running high octane right out of the gate. So gotcha. So what what got me about your story? Very relatable stuff for me sitting in the audience. <clears throat> what really got me about your story was the tragedy you went through. Tell, tell us about that tragedy you went through in that unforeseen accident. Yeah. So uh, I'd say it was right around 2015. It was the height of my career. Uh, I couldn't go anywhere in a tri-state area and you not hear my name on a tactical side. Really? Or um, I'd, I'd done a lot of things uh, for reputation, right? So That's what we call a Billy Badass. <laughs> not far off from that. Um, <laughs> so, but in 2015, uh, I definitely got humbled. So I'm on the way back from the gym and I get involved in an accident. Uh, I rear-ended another vehicle, and my car flipped a few times on top of that vehicle, and I immediately came become uh, I immediately become the first responder. Right, uh, I get out, I assess the vehicle, I go into first responder mode. Long story short, um, three occupants of that vehicle, one was killed instantly, mm-hmm. uh, and two uh, of the occupants, which were uh, minors, uh, ended up dying within 48 hours mm-hmm. post accident. Wow. Um, I came out of that accident unscathed, scratches, that's about it. Uh, and it definitely sent me down a spiral of questioning what was my life about? 
what had I been building everything up for? What have mm -hmm. I been chasing? What was this image persona, yeah. um, ego that I've been building for what, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, what is this life about and who am I? And that, mm -hmm. that sent me on a journey that was more of a figuring out whose I was rather than who I was. Um, I was far from God at that moment, but uh, an incident like that yeah. can definitely for, have you seeking a lot of different things, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and you're getting you know, well. The social media. I mean, I, I could imagine being a cop today. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's uh, you're not only overworked, but compared to what you have to give up, and you have one bad day, everybody in the world knows about yep. you. They know your address. They know your badge number. They know your family and. Uh, but what happened in a crisis, and then there, there's a lot of negative stuff coming at you, like, why should this guy be a cop, mm -hmm. blah, 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 all these different things. Can you tell, tell people a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, you're immediately brandished with all the worst, right? So yeah. he must have been speeding, he must have been drinking and driving, all the things. Yeah. Um, come to find out at the end, I was actually going under the speed limit, wasn't on a phone or anything like that. But immediately you're in the spotlight, you're guilty right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, the public courts. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm that person that that's really hard on myself anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and gives myself all the feedback to try to be better, to try to figure out um, what the opportunities for improvement are. And that's not necessarily a good trait in that situation because what that led to was reading all the tabloids, all the social media posts, yeah, wow. all the comments, right? <laughs> And that sends you down a very, very dark place. Yeah, because one thing to have a opinion online and people don't agree with you and they troll you that way. Yeah. But in this situation, lives are lost. Your yeah. career is on the line. Your future, your, your self-confidence, your self-assurance, a lot of doubt, fear. It's going through your head. I couldn't imagine that all in one type of experience. Yeah. It makes you, uh, you know, question everything. I mean, makes you think about changing your name. <laughs> makes you think about wow. leaving the country. Makes wow. you thinking about jumping off a building. Like yeah. it makes you question everything. Gotcha. Um, it it'll it'll turn you inward to an isolation stance of you get into this uh, phase where you just you think everybody knows. Yeah. Right. I mean, when it's national mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. you you don't think you can walk into anybody, meet anybody that isn't aware of it, hasn't yeah. heard about it, hasn't yeah. seen it or read it. Yeah. And if they haven't, they're going to. Right, yeah. especially in today's day and age, yeah. they'll just Google you right off the bat. For sure, you know you you can meet somebody today, and within five minutes they're googling you. Right, so you run yeah. into that, and that, that stays with you for a long time. I mean, it never goes away. Yeah, for sure, because it's stuck, and you yep. don't control the links. Yep. Um, talk to us about what happened then. At the end of the day, what happened? What did it, what did the court, the actual legal courts, find? Um, so they chose not to indict. Um, they gave me a citation for failure to. Um, avoid collision, control speed to avoid collision. Uh, it was not a popular um, settle, mm -hmm. we'll just say that. And there was probably 32 different things I was being charged with at the time. Mm -hmm. So it all came down to that one citation. And that just honestly reignited the whole thing. Wow. Right. Because then it was, it's because he's a cop, because he's white, because of this, because of that. Really? And then. Wow everybody comes in afterwards about their expectations and their expertise, right? Like, yeah. well, somebody must have messed up the traffic investigation. Um, hate mail comes even twice, three wow. times as much. Uh, you know, I, I spent a good time in my career working undercover, um, chasing different gangs and what have you. Mm -hmm. and I got death threats all the time. Yeah. But believe me when I tell you, the death threats that came from the accident, it's a whole nother level. Wow. Um, wow. and then something like that is obviously, like I said, it's going to follow you forever. Yep. Um, and I had a baby on the way, you know, I'm thinking about a family and mm -hmm. all these things. Yeah. And it just makes you wonder, what have you done to tarnish the name? Are you ever going to be able to create a legacy and something for your kids to aspire to be? Yeah. Or is it always going to be discounted? Right. So Travis, how did it go from somebody passing away, car accident to a citation? Right. Because the outcome of the accident mm -hmm. was the fatalities, right? But the accident itself, um, there's nothing negligent or reckless enough for manslaughter or things of that nature. What I was guilty of was failure to control speed um, mm -hmm. to avoid an accident, mm -hmm. right? No different than if you failed to control your speed and hit a car at a stoplight. I mean, that's a, it's a pretty common occurrence, Got it. right? Got it. 
that's really what it boiled down to was the outcome of the accident not necessarily impacting and influencing the actual um, action. How, how did God show up in a situation? Um, by opening my eyes to the possibility of them. Um, when I think back to that year, because that investigation went on for a good year, and were you like suspended, administrative suspension, or yep, I was suspended for a while. Not the whole year, but yeah. I was suspended for a while. Um, one thing that I that I remember kept pulling me out of a dark space, mm -hmm. confusing, okay. but pulling me out of dark space was people saying like, "Man, you you've got a guardian angel. Like God's <laughs> got plans for you." Yeah. Um, which is a hard thing to hear in that moment when people have lost their lives, right? And it's like, why does God have plans for me? Yep. He's going to take them. Yep. Um, but it was enough for me to start wondering and right? yep. start thinking. God yep. was far out, outside my radar. Sure. And if if those comments, those Christ-like gestures from people mm -hmm. and uh, lack of judgment, lack of gossip, yeah. if that hadn't been there to break up the overwhelming amount of judgment and gossip, uh, I don't know that I'd be here, to be honest, because oh, wow. it got yeah. pretty heavy. Wow. And we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about your move to mm -hmm. Texas here in a second. But sure. let me ask you this question. As a SWAT officer, mm -hmm. somebody that's undercover, somebody that's looking for gang leaders and cartel leaders, what are you looking for? Um, I mean, we can get to all the different profiling things, right? But um, organization, motives, uh, different types of crowds different types of um, signal signs, locales. Uh, everybody operates different, right? The nine to five person has a specific routine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The public servant has a specific routine. The entrepreneur has a specific routine. So does a member of the criminal underworld. Um, they stay in certain pockets. As you elevate to different levels and tiers of that mm -hmm. underworld, you actually yeah. find yourself associating and networking different pockets. Yeah. They're more affluent and what have you. but there are certain things that stand out, right? Different yeah. lifestyle um, abilities, um, different ways of carrying yourself. So body language, attire, things gotcha. that, that kind of really point to it. In, in a minute, everybody, you're gonna you're gonna hear about Travis's rise back from the pit to entrepreneurship and how his business moves had led him to our connection and what he's doing right now here in, in the in the uh, in the Dallas uh, North Dallas area too as well. So. Uh, well, let's talk about you, Jose. Uh, <laughs> I got introduced to you through, uh, through Ryan Stillman. But uh, interestingly, he said that though, when he was in prison, you're the guy. You're the guy running the gangs. You're you're the guy that uh, former cartel leader, and, and uh, a lot of people were in fear of you. So, who is this clean cut guy next to me right now, man? <laughs> what, what, what what happened here? It's called reform. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about your story. Are you, are you originally from Dallas? Yes, born and raised here. Um, same same kind of story rough childhood uh, fed me enough anger and 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 punishment growing up to where at 13 i decided to jump off the porch and venture off to play big boy games uh with the adults at 13 when i decided to jump off the porch uh a lot of things had happened between the ages of 5 and 13 so that was 8 years i'm on my dad's second family so my okay. cousins that i grew up around with were 10 years plus older than us and for whatever reason they they really picked on me like they black eyes broken noses mm -hmm. uh, i hate going to family functions and these these cousins and, and family members live nearby and we lived in a rough neighborhood uh even though our, our fathers were the alligators of those swamps we still had a venture off on our own you couldn't you couldn't hang on to your dad's shirt tail of his influence in the neighborhood, you had to go create your own. Your own name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your own name. Your, own, rep so, your own reputation, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So at 13, I jump off. Um, I go to a family member's, uh, a friend of the family, and I ask him to give me, you know, 13 years old, I'm going to this grown 20, 30-year-old man asking him to front me 10 pounds of weed. Uh, I have a friend whose grandfather was, was selling 20s and ounces out of his yeah. house. Uh, so he's like, nah, if I don't know what you can do with two, why am I going to trust you with 10? So he gave me two pounds of weed. Uh, I take it to my friend, kind of convince him to go pitch it at his grandfather. I made 150 off each one. 
the transaction went smooth. I came back, gave them the money. Now you know what I can do with two. Give me the 10. You're wasting my time, right? 13, mm-hmm. arrogant. I, I was just so full confident in myself. But the transition that that put there was I would I would ask God, I would ask whoever was out there to mm-hmm. make me tougher, make me bigger, make me stronger. I got tired of people picking on me. So I decided to jump out the porch, go start pitching. And I was making, I don't know, about three grand a week, maybe a little bit more. Uh, it's a lot of money for a 13 year old, but I I did it to support my little brothers and my little sister. Interesting. Yeah. So wow. my dad. Were well, you the oldest of you? Uh, I was the okay. oldest. Okay. So my dad had to excuse himself from America for a few years and left my mom to do her own thing with yeah. us. So in my eyes, I felt like, okay, it's time to man up. Let's go fucking. Let's go do our thing. Excuse yeah. my language. Oh, good. Let's go. Good. Let's go do our thing. So, <laughs> Rip. yeah. <laughs> so I started. Uh, I went. I graduated from that to opening. I had friends. So my neighborhood is. It's. It's in West Dallas. It's. It's the Hispanic community, a black community, Hispanic community, a black community, and all the way towards the end is a neighborhood called Cross Hampton. I knew some friends over there because we used to run, ride the bus, and when I grew up in the early '90s, going to school. Uh, we had to meet in a neutral ground for the school bus to pick us up. So mm-hmm. it was blacks against the Mexicans. Mm-hmm. Every morning we had a fight with these dudes. Well, what happens in a fight, you either become the worst enemy or y'all become the best of friends, right? So me and this dude fought for, I don't know, six months, whatever that school year was. I convinced him to open up the projects for me and he would be my partner. And obviously I got things a lot more cheaper than anybody else did. So we opened up the projects. Uh, I ended up renting one room out of a six duplex. And about three months after that, I ended up owing, leasing all six duplexes at the age of 13, 14. Um, You're expanding your operation. Expanding the operation. <laughs> but what, what got me to thinking was, okay. At 13 years old. 13. Okay. I weighed, pretty entrepreneurial. Yeah. Yeah. I weighed about 90 pounds. Uh, I've always been short. Obviously, as you get older, you put on more muscle and, and get mm-hmm. wider, right? Uh, so my next obstacle was how am I going to protect myself against these adult crackheads, right? So these are grown people between the ages of somewhere anywhere between 18 to 50. Uh, they can easily overpower me. Even if I had a gun, mm-hmm. uh, they can easily overpower me and rush me. I, at the moment, I wasn't experienced. Uh, in, in close quarter combats with pistols at the moment. Now I knew how to shoot from here to there, right? Yeah. But if someone's here, yeah, yeah, he can grab sure. me before I'm, I'm able to move. Uh, so I hired two older dudes in the neighborhood that were very influential, and I just gave them dope at my price. So even then, it feeds them and their families just to be able to watch over me. Yeah. So I ended up hiring two goons to watch over me, and then that progress. But they were, but they were also customers of your, of your product yeah okay yeah but right. I, I would front them a big a big but they just couldn't sell on that block they had See, to that's the way you convinced them to to work for you to protect you yeah yeah so i had some gunners one of them to stay on the roof in case somebody came and snatched they can snipe them from the roof we had this whole thing but even that in the winter while everybody was at home drinking chocolate watching the elf movie and <laughs> and all that i'm out there freezing my my little whatever my 13 year old body can muster up in, yeah. in heat mm-hmm. um, out because we didn't have heaters yeah. in, in, in these, these no, six no. duplex. It was cold as heck. Yeah. So just that made me stronger just to be out there shivering and my, my teeth shattering, um, just trying to pitch, just, just building something for myself. Yeah. Saying enough is enough. But what got me there was all that pain yeah. that I was fed, the prayers that I was given uh, in order for God to make you tougher. He's going to put you through rough, terrain yeah. to come out better and stronger yeah uh if you want to learn how to love you're gonna have your heart broken to understand how love works in and out so everything that that i felt was a curse growing up ended up being a blessing as i got older uh i went to tyc at 14 for shooting somebody with uh, TYC? Texas? To murder texas youth commission okay. so it's like the baby penitentiary okay, for teenagers you. That that place is worse than the adult prisons because mm-hmm. you got a bunch of teenage kids with their hormones going crazy, mm-hmm. something to prove, chips on their shoulders. Trying Everybody's there scared, so yeah. they're angry at the same time. Um, so yeah, that was a, a, a that prepared me for the adult prison system. Uh, when I got out, I went right back to selling drugs and and 
playing with guns. And I created a gang before I went to TYC, which is still active right now. That's what's crazy. Uh, 13 year old kid, 14 year old kid creating a gang that's still active 30 something years later is like, wow. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 So your decisions today can carry on for 30 years from now and have an impact mm -hmm. on other people. I'm just curious. Have you gone back to that gang? Hey, listen, no. I was the one who, who started this thing. No, yeah. I, I actually got out of that gang when I was in TYC. Oh, I so I, I started it. I empowered it. And then when I went to TYC, I was like, nah, I'm, I'm due for something better and bigger. I got you. So when I get out, I started acting up again. My father was like, okay, you and your little brother think y'all some badasses. Let me show y'all what badasses are, right? Because I had already went to the baby pen for attempted murder. I was selling drugs, driving the big cars. So he sent us over to the golf of med school. And a notorious golf cartel runs that whole area called the golf cartel. <laughs> And uh, they took us in. Um, one of my uncles is golf cartel. So there's a difference between working for the cartels and being cartel. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference and people don't understand it. Just because you get your drugs from the golf cartel, the Sinaloa cartel doesn't make you Sinaloa cartel or golf cartel. It just means you, they supply you, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people claim to be golf cartel or whatever other cartels that they're working for. There's a few of them. I lost track of how many there are out there right now. But um, my uncle is golf cartel. And the only way to be in that inner circle is through a bloodline. Mm -hmm. So that's where I came in. I was, I was bloodlined into it. And at 16, 17 years old, what they started teaching us is military warfare by the setas, which were... Uh, a military in force for the Mexican army uh, that were trained by the Navy SEALs here in America. It's interesting, bro. Seriously, like, like we're, mm -hmm. we're indirectly training our own enemies. Yeah. yeah. So they started working for the military, but they weren't making enough money and it was dangerous. Yeah. So the golf cartel approached them and said, hey, yeah. get a unit together and yeah. we'll make y'all millions. Mm -hmm. And they eventually ended up venturing off and started the Setas. Um, yeah. So they taught us, <laughs> this is what's crazy. Uh, they taught me military warfare. Uh, they taught me how to, to force my way into an environment, do what I need to do and exit out of there. Um, very good with knives, guns, uh, grenades, explosives. Uh, they also <laughs> taught us- <laughs> corner boy top conversation. With them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they taught us uh, logistics, how to transfer drugs uh, across the US, uh, how to transfer money from whatever areas to point A to point B, uh, how to negotiate with, 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 uh, with people that are in our way, right? Uh, how to negotiate for money or extortion, however that sees fit. So very charismatic, charming people. Uh, they taught us uh, accounting. <laughs> How are they charismatic and charming? <laughs> so and, a, and smile, the, a smile and a, and a gap. Yeah. Right? So, and that goes with what he was saying is there's different things that that people in, in his old field are looking for. They're looking for the bald headed thugs with all the tattoos and, and the flashy clothes. But Honestly, man, the real cartels, they dress just like you. Damn, they wear bro. suits. They wear well, Versace. They seriously? wear real nice clothes. Well, they look like board members in, in mm -hmm. at the GQ wow. magazine. And some of them are in shape. Some of them aren't. Uh, you can't tell. People think that they can tell. And they paint this picture of these gallant cowboy hats and these mm -hmm. big mustaches. Mm -hmm. Nobody looks like that. Yeah. There yeah. are some that, yeah. that had inherited that old culture. But we understand that you need to be able to look more like a businessman than a guy with a big yeah. John Holmes mustache, right? Yeah. And and the old gallon hat from Boss Hog. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, we weren't the type of, now they're very violent individuals, yeah. Yeah. borderline evil. Like I've seen some very empty souls uh, there were shells of of men who had no remorse for 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 life at all. I've seen some horrific things. I've seen chainsaws go to work. I've seen machetes go to work. I've seen dynamite go to work. I've seen body parts that weren't supposed to be apart from each other. Um, at 17 years old, 
my mind had just developed between the ages of seven and 14. That's when your mind's still developing mm -hmm. yeah. into yeah. adulthood, trying yeah. to figure out where you're going to. So all of this, even though it felt wrong, yeah. it was only right I knew because the people that were supposed to be protecting me and providing me and giving me wisdom and understanding to be a better person growing up yeah. were directing me in that direction. So to me, I, I wasn't doing anything wrong. Yeah. Uh, normal children with normal families, if you steal a vehicle, and they're like, okay, we're going to call your mom. They were afraid. Oh, don't call my mom. Call my dad. Call my yeah. dad. My mom is going to beat my ass. Well, I didn't have that. Yeah. My parents were like, go. Mm -hmm. Go do whatever it is you need yeah. to do. So it's kind of like a hall pass to go live your wildest, most yeah. dangerous in, uh, life that you could possibly live. And, and me thinking, okay, this is my family raising me, telling mm -hmm. me that this is good. I love my family. I'm going to protect and provide for my family. But most importantly, I'm going to represent for my family. So they taught us accounting. They taught us logistics. Obviously, <laughs> logistics. <laughs> yeah. How to get 17. intelligence. I mean, that's the thing. It's just, it really is like you're saying. Uh, I mean, there's levels to it, right? Yeah. That was one thing I, you learn on the other side. It's like it, it's a business at the end of the day, right? Like yeah. there's so many pieces that... Whether legit business or in, here in underground business, it's still the yeah. principles of business. Yeah, the structure is still yeah. the same. Everything still gets leveled up and layered up. And um, yeah, the, the ones that you can easily pick are usually the ones that you have to watch for because they got something to prove and they're just don't, out there doing stupid stuff. Yeah. The other ones, it's, it's literally like a like a business. Yeah. Otherwise, the cartels don't really want to be seen. No. Their car, their carpet and conceal is. Mm -hmm. Is is the way to dress and looking like a legit businessman. So when I interviewed Ryan Steuben, he talked to me about the time in prison where he was starting to teach financial education, <laughs> principles of capitalism, and entrepreneurship. Yeah. And for months there, there was peace because you found different games were actually doing business with one another. Well, you happen to be one of those guys. Yeah. What happened in that scenario? So uh, I'm big on chess. I love playing chess. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a student of that of that game just because of the way it expands your mind where, you know, on the board, you got to think ahead. Okay, why did Matt move his pawn over here? Uh, right. Was he trying to open up for it? You start asking your questions and then you start seeing any possible area where you can attack me. Um, so I was playing chess and as we were sitting there talking, we have enough money to start opening businesses outside of prison. And I was like, we ought to get into real estate. So I asked around some, in uh, one of the shot callers for the white boys named Shotgun, uh, said, there's a guy here, just got here. His name's Ryan. He lives downstairs in Mike Rapani's room. Uh, he does mortgages, so he <laughs> understands real estate. So there's, in my cell, I used to have two tables sit out there and my, my cell was like at the end of the hallway. So that's where everybody hung out at, my mm -hmm. guys. And they'd sit out there, smoke weed, drink alcohol. Uh, in prison? Yeah, in prison. Uh, shoot dice, cell phones. They have Rolexes. In prison? In prison. <laughs> yeah, we live different in it. When you got money, you live different in there. Okay. In the influence. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, so I sent two of the big goons. They're, they were like best friends. They like fighting and beating up on each other. I'm like, hey, I got something for y'all to do. Go get this guy named Ryan Stuman. He lives with Michael Pani. Bring him up here. So you got these two monsters, probably about as tall as both of y'all, big dudes, tattoos on their faces, necks. It looked pretty intimidating. Mm -hmm. uh, the story is, I, I didn't go with them, but the story is they went and knocked on the door and Mike and him uh, were in there and they were like, which one of y'all is Ryan? And said, uh, I said, he is. He said, all right, uh, Wawa wants to talk to you. That's you? Yeah. He said, he wants to talk to you, go upstairs. So when they close the door, Mike's like, hey, bro, what'd you do? He goes, I, I literally just got here. I, I, what do you want me to do? I don't know. He goes, hey, go up there and fix that. Don't bring that to my cell. Go up there and fix that. It's so that. funny. I mean, he just gets there. Everybody knows, know the, everybody knows the drop. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody. Oh, right? my, yeah, we're trying to launder some money. And this, this is the man that can do it for us. Go get him for me. Yeah. So uh, he comes upstairs in my, my hallway. They called it Whiskey Row. Because when you turned off the lights at night, you couldn't really see anything past your hand. Oh, wow. So it was a dangerous, it was dangerous up there, like wow. huge dangerous. And uh, if you were a snitch or a child molester or anything with those level of charges, yeah, yeah people would convince you to go up there at night. Yeah, you probably <laughs> wouldn't come back down, yeah. not walking. Wow. And uh, he gets up there. I finished my game with this guy. We would play for $50 a move. 
So that means if I made 10 moves and I lose, oh, yeah. I pay the $50 for each move that God. I made and so back and forth just to keep it interesting. It's a lot of money in prison. Yeah, it is. But <laughs> yeah, but it's the feds. It's not the state. So the feds is more mainly conspiracy, drug dealers, uh, um, what's this, like Ponzi schemes, mm -hmm. doctors, things yeah. like that. So there's a lot of money in there that not. And uh, we have a conversation with him. He comes in. He looks kind of, so I get up, all right, let me, let me disarm this dude. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing, man? My name is Wawa, man. Go ahead and have a seat. You want something to drink? So he's still in prison. You don't offer people something because they think you're going to want something in return. <laughs> you <want> some, <laughs> some people are like that, man. But trust me, I, I wasn't. I really wanted to feed the guy because, I mean, the yeah. law of recipro reciprocity, right? right? You give him something, he feels obligated <laughs> to give you something back. Give you're still him. a gentleman. Even though you're <laughs> to, okay. Yeah. So we sit down and, and I asked him what our problem was. And but he just got up. Get, we gave him some paper and some pencils. And he went to work explaining it to us. Wow. And before you knew it, all the guys that were outside my cell smoking weed they were all bunching yeah. in what's he saying what's he saying yeah. like we were sitting there and he he was preaching the gospel of real estate and, and money laundering for us so that was pretty interesting but there's something i don't i don't know what it was about ryan but i knew that i needed to be tied in with this guy i didn't understand it at the time mm -hmm. um so before he left, I wasn't going to let him leave without yeah. giving me his number and yeah. contact information because I yeah. saw a lot of value in his eyes. I think I think I saw more in him than he saw in himself at that moment because yeah. I was never attached to anybody in prison like that. Yeah. And I stayed, he got out seven years before I did. And for seven years, I would talk to him Thanksgiving and Christmas. So for seven years, I stayed in contact with wow. him. And you, you call him? Yeah, I would yeah. call him on the phone or I, I wasn't even a collect call from. No, so I that, actually paid for him. Oh, okay. okay yeah, sure, we okay. paid for him in the feds. And uh, I would call him. We'd have a 15 minute conversation because that's the limit. And uh, I'd call him twice a year for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, I knew he was busy doing his own thing. Then he tells me, hey, I got married. I got a kid. Oh, shit. Damn, he's growing pretty fast out there. And uh, next thing I know, when I got out, I'm like, hey, uh, Caesar's back in Rome. When can we talk? And uh, he invited me over. Well, actually, he invited me over to this sky, this sky rise he was living in, having an event. And mm -hmm. I walked in. You got to remember, I'm still at the halfway house. So when I walk in, uh, he's got a suit on, kind of like what you got on. <laughs> okay. And uh, so not Ryan today, but uh, <laughs> he black had a suit on, you know, <laughs> black t-shirt, black jeans. <laughs> and uh, he had 30 beautiful white people's faces just looking at him as he was preaching something. I didn't understand what he was doing. And uh, he sees me, he says my name, waves at me, and he continues teaching his class. Um, I ended up meeting his current wife, Amy. I met some of the staff members. They yeah. all seemed nice. Yeah. I, and, and he was giving me books and some of his T-shirts. I'm like, bro, you were writing books since you got out. He left me. That's one thing that he did leave me when I was in prison. He left me a ton of books that yeah. I've actually read two or three times each. Great. And uh, that's what got me on that journey for the next seven years to read uh, books on business. Yeah. Um human behavior um, and pretty much adopt the things that I had from the cartels. So when I was invited, I actually asked them for a job. I was at the halfway house. I was like, bro, I need a job. I need to be around people like you. Uh, he says, well, I can't pay you much because like, honestly, you don't know anything about the internet. I'm like, look, what, what do I need to learn about the internet to roll with you? Wow. He says, uh, get you a laptop, get you an Apple. And then he connected me with one of the guys he was working with that taught me how to turn it on, how to log in and Seriously, set up from all the software. Stuff, yes. Wow. I, I didn't know anything about the internet. I didn't know. I, I didn't even know the internet existed. I couldn't yeah. even use my, my phone. Yeah. I didn't yeah. FaceTime. Wow. What the fuck? I could see you on my phone. <laughs> you know? So I did 15 years in the feds uh, consecutive. That means day to day for 15 years. Uh, I've done 21 years in prison my entire life and I'm 45. So I've done half of my life in prison. Holy moly. So yeah. How, old, how old were you when, when you first went in? Uh, I was 14 when I went in. I did two years there and then two years here, three years. It took me two years to beat uh, two murder cases. Wow. Um, I was in there for 180 days and they finally let me out on bond. I was fighting for a bond and I was able to uh, showcase that I was innocent in front of my peers. So um, I beat those two murder cases, but I did some a little bit of time there. But the real stretch was the 
18 years. Then I got 210 months in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I did 15 on that. So when I got out, that one hurt. 15 yeah. years what, hurt. What, what was that for? A conspiracy to manufacture and distribute methamphetamine and cocaine. Damn, 15 years. Or, 15. Eight, or 18 years. Yeah, I got 18 years. I did 15 on it. The only reason I did 15 on that one was because Obama or the Bush administration uh, gave us two points, which is kind of deducted for nonviolent offenders. Mm. Well, that particular case wasn't violent. It was just yeah. a conspiracy. I actually had no dope. It's just hearsay, she say. But 15 years. Wow. 15 years, and yeah. they didn't catch me with anything. Um, so when I get out, I'm like, hey, I need a job. He's like, well, I'll pay you 250 or whatever. And what, what year was this when you got out? 2000. This was November. I got out November 15, 2014. But I was, I wow. went straight to the halfway house. I had three yeah. months to do there. Wow. So while I was there, I was trying to learn about social media, about, he's like, the first thing he tells me was get a Facebook. So December, December something of 2014 is the date I started my Facebook. And it's a reminder because I got it on there. And uh, so I'm like, look, bro, whatever you need me to learn, I'm going to learn it. He said, I could give you 250 bucks or whatever. I can't pay you much. I told him, no, I'll pay you. I just need a job and I need to be around what you got going. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it would have been easy to grab some of my old drug money and start a business, go get into real estate or. I was about to ask you that. Yeah, there's a ton of things that I could have done. Yeah. Like uh, one of my best friends, a lot of people know who I'm talking about. Like he's real good friends with Jerry Jones. He built the star for Jerry Jones. Mm -hmm. um, Multi-millionaire, very successful. Uh, he was the first one to reach out his hand and be like, come on, let's go make millions. Uh, That's good. But I didn't like, and this is, and this oh, is probably life, my weakest. Life. Yeah, this yeah. is my weakest flaw is accepting help from my friends. Just because you're a millionaire, I'm not going to look at you different. I'm looking at you mm -hmm. as the person. Yeah. I, I don't, I've, I, I've had millions before. Yeah. It didn't make me a better person. It just made me more of who I am. Gotcha. Um so I, I tell him, look, give me 250, I'll pay you 500. I just I just wanna be around here, I'll pay for this. Um, I just don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing. He, I went through all his digital programs uh, to this date. I haven't added it up, but it's over $150,000 that he has invested in my education. I don't know what this dude saw in me other than working hard, eager to learn and change my life. And uh, he gave me the opportunity by investing in me and giving me the opportunities to uh, to transfer into or transition into corporate world and just continues. I just continue to prove myself to Who, be loyal. Again? Ryan. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he, in other words, it took a guy that's in the same shoes you were to mm -hmm. get out, to win in business, to really reinvest back into somebody to make sure they don't go back to that life. And now I'll pass it along as much Amen as I can. Amen to that, bro, man. That's what that, yes. that, see, people wonder why capitalism and entrepreneurship uh, heal people. Because yeah. when you give a man economic empowerment, he doesn't want to go back to that life. No. And put his life and time at risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right? and, and so, uh, for, for you, um, so talk to us about how your faith and finance, they started to intersect when you moved moved here out to, to Frisco, Texas. When did it all start to come together for you? Sure. Once all those allegations dropped, I cleared all that, um, was back on the road. And all that perspective really made me just, like I said, think, like, what was I doing? What was the goal? What kind of legacy did I want to leave? What do I want this name to stand for? All that, right? Um, during that time, I I've always never been okay with enough. So even when I was a cop, you know, you get a lot of time off if yeah. you choose to. Um, always had some side hustles, making a couple extra bucks here or there. So you, you never, those you were just weren't. Comfortable, just being comfortable. You, want, you always want to grow and progress and yeah, reinvent always, yourself. Yeah, couldn't, okay. sit, couldn't sit still. Gotcha. Right. So, um, in that in that time period, uh, one of these side hustles I had going on was in network marketing, and uh, I, I went to a convention and met this uh, guy named Scott Unklebach, who ultimately oh, wow, no introduced kidding. me to uh, Keith Kraft, who was speaking on yeah. stage at this event. Um, <clears throat> Something about this guy, he just had it dialed in, right? Like yeah. he, he's a think coach and then some. Yeah. And uh, by the way, for those who go to Elevate Life Church, this is Garrett Uncle Box who runs uh, Mighty Men on yep. Saturday. This is his dad. Correct. At it. Mm -hmm. And he's buddy buddies with yep. he's Pastor Keith Kraft. Best friends for 40 years. <laughs> That's awesome. They, they built that church. Literally, Scott built the church. 
Um, so entrepreneur helps correct. Scott be a job. Mm-hmm. I love it. There it is. Yep. And Scott saw something to me. I don't know what it was, but he kept pouring it into me. And then I heard Keith speak one day and I was like, man, this guy's got it dialed in. And, uh, at the end found out he was a pastor. And he's you up know there with, no, he's just he's a leadership like, coach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up there with 26 inch biceps and Jordans <laughs> and a t-shirt. And I'm like, I may be able to go to that church. <laughs> so, um, started really, uh, seeking out his content and mm-hmm. reading his books and yeah. what have you. And as I really started to evaluate whether or not I wanted to continue law enforcement, I knew I didn't want to be up in the Northeast anymore. So I wanted to get back home to Texas. Um, as I, decide to recalibrate what the vision was going to be, the legacy was going to be, whether I stayed in law enforcement, didn't, what have you, get back home to Texas, get reseated, uh, originally from Houston, and uh, didn't want to go back to Houston. And I just felt called towards Frisco, which is where Keith pastored, right? So I decided I'm just going to pick it all up and drive to Frisco and nice. cash in and see what happens. And you've never been in Frisco? No, uh, I take that back. I went to Frisco once over this like three month period of me deciding. I went to church wow, once it. and left about halfway in. Felt like I didn't belong there. Um, to be honest, I was still figuring it out. Right? It wasn't elevate. It was. Oh, it was elevate. Yeah, it was. Wow. Elevate. But I went in. I was just like, you know, I I, I went in. I ducked in the back and yeah. up in the top of bleachers, yeah. and I was like, I, I don't, I'm still trying to figure out who knows me from this accident. Right? Uh, like yeah, yeah. something I'm wearing on me. So uh, came in late, left early, yeah. whole thing. But I, I definitely felt comfortable that this was the area to move to. Yeah. So packed everything up, um, headed out that way, which everybody thought was crazy. Right? Yeah. You, know, you have a retirement as a cop, and <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? I don't know. Where are you going to live? I don't know. Like, you know how a house yeah. picked out? Nope. Uh, that retirement's worth 65K when you're 60. Um, cool. If I need 65K when I'm 60, I probably did it wrong. <laughs> right. So uh, drove on down towards Frisco. I think I stopped in Nashville or Memphis at a truck stop, rented a house off Craigslist after I took a shower. And uh, never saw it. Just no, rented, sight, sight unseen. Sight unseen yeah. Just rented it. I was like, hopefully it's still there. Yeah. Put my deposits down, showed up. It was a real house, uh, real agent. Um, they didn't scam you. Uh, yep. No, no Venmo scams. Correct. Yeah. So I had a little bit of cash saved aside and took a couple of weeks to figure it out. Do I want to go back into restaurants? What yeah. do I want to do? Um, yeah. And sales had always kind of tugged at me. Because at yeah. the end of the day, whether it's restaurants, whether it's being a t- uh, detective, just being a human being, mm-hmm. it sells. It's yeah. just people skills, being a human. Okay. Um, so I decided to take a stab at sales. And concurrently started going to Elevate Life Church. Uh, 2016 is when I moved here and excelled in sales, started, got to a point where I was in outside sales, making about 20, 25K a month. Um, Never had that kind of money. No kidding. Uh, What were you selling? uh, Energy efficiency. So radiant barrier, insulation, solar attic fans, HVAC, things like that. And um, decided... Right around 2019 is when the whole faith and financial side really started mm-hmm. to collide because I got saved and baptized in 2019, and then I opened my first business in 2019. I, I was going back and forth with the two biggest competitors in um, energy efficiency, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then I said I wanted to I want to see at the table. 1%, whatever that looks like. I'm not greedy. Yeah. But you mean I'm, equity position. Yeah, I'm making yeah. you guys a lot of money. Uh, I was, I think, in sales, I was averaging about 1.8 to 2 a year. Uh, and that was pretty good for installation sales. See? And yeah, nice. um, it was a, a no. I was like, cool. Well, I can go do this. I think. <laughs> so came up with a logo and uh, contacts with the crews. Yeah. And 2019 started my own. Did just under a million sales, net about 350. And then uh, one month, I net one, 105, 106, actually. And I was like, I got to do something with this. So nice. I just kind of started to spiral with that. And the growth from business and entrepreneurship paralleled directly with my faith and my obedience and yeah. and um, really pushing after yeah, seeking God and, and um, being very diligent about my alignments and my intentionality with what I was doing and what I felt my purpose was yeah. and, and that whole um, unveiling for sure. Praise God, man. Yeah. Awesome. What about you? 
Uh, what, what, what do they call you? Wawa. Wawa. <laughs> <laughs> when did faith and finance cross your path to leave that life? Recently, I grew up a Catholic, but I never felt Catholic, if that makes sense. I, ne I never agreed. Put it like this. So we heard so many stories growing up that when the priest would walk by us, I would mm -hmm. grab my little brothers and stand in front mm -hmm. of them, like stand yeah. behind me. Yeah. Like just behind the rumors or whatever mm -hmm. they got going on at the Vatican that they hide, right? Yeah. So I, I was a little distance from that, grew up very superstitious. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe in God, all these horrible things are going to happen to you. Um, it wasn't until October 1st at Ryan's uh, birthday party. I, <laughs> I don't want to say I got cornered, but I think it was premeditated. I had a conversation with two very strong uh, men of God. One of them's named Steve Weatherford and the other one's named David Harris Jr. Of course, two good guys, man. <laughs> Perfect, I love these guys. Yeah. yeah. So these two dudes start talking to me. First, uh, I see Steve talk to Dave and then yeah. and then he sits down and he starts a conversation so funny, with me. Both of these guys have been on the podcast. It's funny that you mentioned oh, these names. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> There's there some of the first podcasts went with the Dallas. That's okay. great. Right, right. So you, you, you know they're genius, right? They're very intelligent individuals, very persistent. And, uh, these are big guys too, man. They so are some big so dudes, so man. So they ain't no little dudes. Guys. So when they corner you, they corner you. <laughs> yeah. So he starts talking to me about God. Hey, man, tell me a little bit about your story. I tell him a little bit about my story. I'm very transparent. So it, it, it's it, whatever you you do in the dark or you try to hide or 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 broom it under a carpet, um, and then you grow up to be, let's just say, CEO of a company. Uh, people can try to use that against you. But if you just put it out there and not ashamed of your past, what can they use against you? Well, I'm going to tell, tell the people you used to be associated with prison gangs, or I'm going to tell them you were associated with the cartels. Yeah. I'm going to ruin your reputation. It's already out there. Why yeah. am I going to be sure. hiding it? Right. Yeah. So um, Interesting. I, I have that conversation with them, not as in-depth as I, I went in here with you, but uh, one thing I was having a problem is forgiving myself for the crimes that I've committed in the past. Um, I couldn't forgive myself, so I didn't feel like I can look in God's face mm. Um, mm. and tell him that I'm an honorable man, a man of God, a man who loves him. I've always felt this presence, but I was never seeking him. I was more hiding from him. And there's something that David told me, David Harris Jr. He says, God sent his only son to be slaughtered and his blood to purify and clean everybody's sins in this world. But yours? Dang, that hit hard. Why am I so special that he that his blood can forgive everybody's sins but mine? That was my doing. Wow. So that's where he got me. I I first I, I backed up away. I went outside. I'm like, hey Ryan, I'm gonna have to leave, bro. Yep. He's like, what's up? I said, I got Steve and David mm -hmm. in there. They're about to dunk me in your swimming pool, bro. I got a feeling that that's that what they're wanting to do. <laughs> I, I didn't understand how you received God, uh, Jesus, in, in your heart. So I agreed to them. They caught me. They cornered me again that same night. I should have, no, oh, I should, I shouldn't have not ran. So I did the right thing. Um, so he's like, are you willing to accept God today to be your your Lord and Savior? I said, yes, I do. After they told me that. They went and got Ryan and we walked into Ryan's bedroom and they laid their hands on me and uh, they just prayed over me. I repeated some words that they asked me to repeat and I accepted them into uh, into my heart. That was my first day. It was October 1st, 2022. Um, was it in August? Mm -hmm. August, I just quit. I've never been a guy what I call straddle the fence. If me and you are best friends and you don't like this person, I might not have problems with them. But if you got problems with him, I got problems with him too. Sure. I'm not going to straddle the friends. I'm not going to be his friend and your friend too. Yep. Um, so why would I do that to God? Why would I straddle the fence, have one foot in with God and one foot outside doing yeah. whatever I want to do? So it came to a point in my life where I just, um, I called Travis and I'm like, bro, I want to get baptized. And then he's like, well, okay, cool. He goes, how do you want to do it? As soon as, before I responded to him, I had reached out to uh, Steve and I'm like, I want to get baptized. 
Then he got excited. If you know Steve, <laughs> he's, he's always sending videos. Yeah, yeah. So he was excited. He couldn't wait to do it. He said, allow me, let's do it in my home. Yeah. Invite yeah. anybody you want to invite. Yeah. Just come on in. I call Ryan. I'm like, bro, I decided I want to get baptized. And uh, Steve's like, hey, uh, one of my other friends, Mike, I'm like, I'm getting baptized Sunday. Do you want to be there? He says, yeah. I can be there next Sunday, bro. If you could push it, I'm in whatever he was overseas somewhere yeah. vacationing he says i'll be back i said i love you bro but i can't wait it has to be this sunday no matter what it's going to be this sunday call ryan i'm getting baptized sunday it mean a lot to me to be there he said i wouldn't miss it for the world hmm. so steve and travis get together and they're like who do you want here i said i want this to be a king's baptism i want nothing but warriors here so that room was pretty impressive of the of the gentlemen that were in there um it was it was it was something special but i wanted it to be done that sunday because you never know what can happen sure outside of that yeah, i yeah. knew that at least sunday Urgency. i would yeah, be yeah, there yeah. and uh it went through um we, we showed up everybody was there everybody i invited was there um did my baptism it was it was it was beautiful the the messages that i got and the motivation other people started getting baptized yeah, because awesome. of that yeah so yeah. that's that was touching i gotta set the stage for you because yeah. he's not he's not highlighting it enough picture a so steve's one of my best friends and obviously jose as well we, you know we, we came in alignment about a year or so ago imagine a living room with about a dozen guys tatted up gucci louis rolexes iced out <clears throat> come and see former cartel get baptized by a narco and a Super Bowl champ. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are the odds of that? Yeah, right? Right. It was, it was, it was only, pretty only, cool. Only God brings those stories together. Absolutely, if you, right. you don't think God can use in your, your mess, you're shortchanging yourself. Yeah. God can use you in a very powerful way, yeah, as, yeah. as you're seeing with these two guys mm -hmm. here. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, but I, was, uh, I had Steve come by earlier this year to talk to my guys. Yeah. And next thing you know, man, we're baptizing people. In my <laughs> he's on fire for Christ, man. He's on fire oh, for Jesus. He's, he's on fire. Man, he's just, he's on fire. Man, yeah. This guy right here, he's, uh, so we, we meet up with him Tuesdays at 530 in the morning at his house just to do prayer. Yeah. Uh, one thing he said, what can I do for you? I said, teach me how to pray over others. Yeah. Uh, I got a friend named Brandon Brittingham. Uh, every time he gets up on stage, he's like, pray over me. Pray over me, mm -hmm. pray over me. And uh, he's wrote post about, it. he's a pretty big influencer in the real estate world. He uh, he started that with me. Just, yeah. he says, bro, I feel it when you pray over me because people have the the misconception that God is weak or you gotta turn your cheek yeah, or you have to not cuss and behave. What people don't understand is God is a God of war. He loves his warriors. He loves his yeah, soldiers. Sure. He loves, uh, the biblical is, is Filled with war. Mm -hmm. Filled with war. Yeah, and warriors. And, and warriors. <laughs> and there's David's sure. mighty men. There, there yeah. we go. And he is the one entity that exists that demands, demands. He don't ask you for it. He demands the level of respect. Don't pray to other gods. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm warning you. Mm -hmm. I'm warning mm -hmm. you. You don't want what's coming with that. <laughs> what and uh, he'll destroy countries. And, and yeah. there's one statement on there that says, I will erase you and your whole bloodline from the face of this earth. You will never existed here. That was the most powerful gangster shit I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. I said, that's the kind of God I could get behind. As, as you wrap up, I, I want to ask you the question. I'm going to ask you the same question too as well. People are recreating themselves for the new year. People are recreating themselves constantly, whether it's the new year or not. They're sick and tired of life. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. What's one, two, three actionable steps that you can give people? You're the CEO of Phone Sites and a closer marketing here in Plano, Texas. You're obviously on a very uh, big success path, uh, uh, trending upward. What would you tell somebody to how, how to recreate themselves? They don't like what their life is like. They don't like what their years turn out to be. They don't want the same to be repeated next year. What would you tell them? That's a good one. I would tell everybody that no matter what you're currently going through, those are lessons that you're going to need to come out of the storm that you're currently at. If you really want change, don't wait until you hit the bottom, get lost in a sauce, go into them dark places where you start hating yourself and doubting yourself and killing your own confidence. Use all the lessons, like in my lessons when I was in a cartel, 
accounting. I use that for my P and L. So crazy. Management. Instead of running killers and and ops, I'm running sales teams and marketing teams. I'm running businesses. Um, logistics. How to transfer you know, shirts or things that we're currently selling books and how to logistically get them to our clients. Everything that I've learned in the cartels, because it was a business, I brought it into the corporate world. And it's not only that, I'm educated in the corporate world, but tying that into it um, just makes me a little bit more stronger. Being COO, a kid from the slums, a kid in gangs, a kid in cartel, a kid, a kid who's done uh, numerous years in prison to come out and be able to do that. If you apply yourself and you use the things that you use right now, remember this, God made us all perfect. Yeah. Nobody is worthless in this world. And yeah. he's given us talents to use. Now, if he can't use those talents because you shy away from them, then you can be useless. You're not worthless, yeah. but you can be useless. If God can't use you for the talents that belong to him, mm -hmm. that he gifted you, you become useless to him. I never wanted to be useless. Right. I wanted to be useful. Yeah. Amen. So that's that. what I got. You don't want to remove yourself from the favor of God, man. Amen. Go. Awesome. Amen. Amazing. Travis, how would you answer the same question? Um, it, I, I feel like it's actually really simple, <clears throat> not necessarily easy, right, to, to really grow. Um, everybody's got demons, whether it's a previous life, mm -hmm. whether it's an accident, whether it's liking cheeseburgers, sure. um, alcohol, whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. Um, you either run from your demons or you conquer them, right? So you, if you decide to just stand up, because it's all under your control, if you conquer your demons, you can claim your kingdom, right? And that's what God's got for us. So there, there's one actionable tactical step that a mentor gave me a while back that uh, I've given a lot of clients and I've done myself. It's just hugely powerful is sitting down and is just writing out your obituary. Right? I don't know if you've ever heard of that, um, but just sit down yeah. and- I'm going to laugh in church because we talk about this stuff yeah, all the time, of course. Right? So yeah. crazy thing to do though. Write down what it is you think people will or you want for them to say yeah. about you, who you yeah. were, how you impacted people around you, so on and so forth, right? And if you're not there, just what are the steps to get there, right? Write, write out those actionable things and those traits, mm -hmm. write out what you believe, put the, the great thing about internet nowadays is with influencers and social media and Instagram, like you can literally start picking your avatars of what you want, right? They're out there. Um, they're out there. Yeah. And nothing is unique, right? Like it's all, whether it's self-development, growth, all of it boils down to the Bible at the end of the day, like it's all templated out just sure. to find what really relates to you. Yeah, King Solomon said, there's nothing new created underneath the sun. Yep. The only thing different is you, Correct. you, you, yep. you, yep. that's, we're, that's what's unique. <clears throat> and we're visual people. So yeah. find the people that you visually yeah. are attracted to, yeah. find their routines and use that as a staple and as a base and you'll refine it from there and have your own. Yeah. But it's, it's really not hard. That's awesome, man. I'm reminded of the scripture, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope. In a good future. And when I was in Chicago, I was like, I want to live somewhere in Texas. I don't know where. And I put my hands on the map. I said, look at Dallas. And I looked at Dallas. I zoomed out. And I saw this land called Prosper, Texas. I'm like, what a great city to live in. Yeah, Prosper. Prosper, Texas. I ended up right below it in Frisco. But uh, to, to be here in Texas to see um, these men uh, come together and have God use them. And I believe that for you too as well. If you're watching this podcast, you listen to this podcast, and you don't think God can use it in a very mighty and powerful way, listen to these guys. Look what God has done in their lives. And and all I believe is this. You can always recreate yourself in any given moment. You can recreate yourself at the speed of a decision. And I also believe, too, that the best of your life is still ahead of you. I believe the best days and the best mm -hmm. moments, your best decisions, your best scenarios and experiences are still ahead of you. And uh, if you're watching this right now and you have not accepted the Lord into your life, we'll reach out to these gentlemen, reach out to us. We'll usher you in, in that right direction. we got a large network across the country, and we want to be able to help you in not just your finances, but also most importantly is your faith. Okay. Because uh, if God can work to you, he can work through you. And watch these gentlemen right now, what they're doing in their lives. Businesses, 
entrepreneurs, not consumers, but generators and producers of value. And uh, seeing God move in their life is very inspiring to me. I'm just very proud of you guys. I appreciate you guys making time to come here on the Seven Figure Squad podcast. And if uh, you want to follow these gentlemen, put all their links in the descriptions below. Make sure you follow their stories here on Instagram. They're kicking out a ton of value, helping people out. Make sure you surround yourself with the right people. So therefore, the right circumstances, right situations can happen in your life. That being said, please subscribe, hit like, drop your comments below. You agree with us? You don't agree with us? Please let us know. You might use that comment in a future episode in the future. That being said, on behalf of these gentlemen from Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart guy. Until we meet again, continue to smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye.